Thank you, Charlie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. OK, can, am I sounding clear, Charlie? Yeah, you're fine. Fabulous. Um, delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Charlie. I'm going to speak to you uh, um, fairly briefly about three key points. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the new world of work. So I'm going to argue that the, the world of work since COVID has been turbocharged and we're seeing changes coming immediately that would have taken 10, 15, 20 years. So I'm going to talk about that, how things are changing. I'm then going to give you an idea particularly uh, about um, how jobs will change, uh, we think, according to our research over the next few years. I'm going to talk about the new category of jobs that are being invented as we speak. Um, so I did a TED talk last year and I talked about zombie jobs, jobs which are being replaced by technology. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about new types of jobs um, and how we need to think differently about the world of work. Uh, and, and crucially, we've got to get out of our idea, out of our minds, these old 20th century uh, ways of thinking about the world of work. We've got to realise it's a new century uh, and, and things have changed. And then finally, I'm going to give you some tips about how to be successful in this new world of work. So I do, I do hope you find it useful. Um, so, so these are revolutionary times, of course, you know, really revolutionary. And think about great revolutionaries uh, in history. Think about Lenin. Uh, I saw a quote recently that I've been using with our own students at Liverpool, when Lenin said, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. Well, I think we've been living through that sort of revolutionary change that Lenin talked about. Without any shadow of a doubt, we've been living through this transformation. And of course, like all revolutions, it brings forward changes which would have taken a long time to come about. So things are happening very soon. Uh, if take, for example, how we are working today. Me and Charlie available uh, via Microsoft Teams, but the, the, the platforms that people are using now are, are the ways that, that work is being transformed as we speak. Uh, if you look at Microsoft Teams, 44 million daily users. Well, that was in March. It's now way up almost 80 million people are now using Teams every single day. 16% um, of recruiters are now saying they're only going to be hiring people who work from home from now on. They're not going to be recruiting anyone to work in offices. So, so the world of work has shifted within the last few months and people are now saying, what's the point of an office? And they, they're beginning to start these discussions. So we're living through these transformations. And I'm very acutely aware that for some people, this is just absolutely terrifying. It's unnerving, shocking, uh, strange. It makes them feel, where are we going? What's the future going to be? All this was predicted by a great futurologist called Alvin Toffler, who wrote a book in the 1970s called Future Shock. And, and Toffler said basically in the future, i.e. now, change will be happening so quickly that people just won't wouldn't be able to cope with it. He talked about too much change in too short a period of time. People would be lost, uh, confused, permanently confused by this change and transformation. He also coined another phrase. He used, he coined the phrase information overload. And I think, you know, many people who are at home now working from home, dealing with nonstop emails and Zoom and team calls will probably identify with that future shock. Um, the key thing is, though, for young people today, the people listening to this call, we can't, you, they can't afford future shock. They've got to try and deal with this because this is for them their new reality. Um, and I think that one of the, the key things we've got to do is understand that technology are far better than we have been doing. This is a great quote from Melvin Kranzberg, again, another IT futurologist. He talked about this technology that we're using every day now is neither good nor bad. Nor is it neutral, it changes the way people think about themselves and how they see themselves in the world. It changes the way we communicate. And again, I think that's having an implication that we didn't foresee. It's changing the way people behave with each other. Um, so that's a, that's a key idea which I'll come back to as we go on. So today, uh, confirmation and clearing taking place around the country, students from around the around the country thinking about where they're going to study. Um, it's it's worth pausing it pausing a few minutes, I think, just to think about what it means to be a student today. Um, our new students face a future of ubiquitous globalization, technology, and information. From now on, this information is everywhere they go. Ubiquitous globalization tech and technology. Um, our new students who will be joining universities 
this year have a 50-50 chance of living to be 105. Just think about that, 105, 50-50 chance of being 105. To put that in context, in London in 1990, uh, sorry, the 1900, the average age of death for a man in 1900 was 47. For a woman, it was 50. So the world has transformed itself and people are living far longer than our great grandparents could have ever imagined. This transformation has taken place uh, in our own lifetimes. So this information is going to be about everything from anywhere, anytime available, at unlimited speed and on all types of devices. So, so our students now come into university wearing more technology than existed in the world in the 1960s. And they, they, they have access to technology which would have been unthinkable um, just 10, 15 years ago. So, so our students have access to incredible information which is transforming the way they see themselves in the world. All of this is doing, making it incredibly ridiculously easy to do all this, create, collaborate, connect, copy, share, codify and export. When I was a student in 1840, the only organisation that could do this was the BBC. From now on, every student has this technology in his or her pocket via their phone. So students today are, are living through extraordinary times and they're empowered to communicate and to engage and to learn in ways which would have been unimaginable not long ago. So people are, have incredible advantages. Crucially though, we know many of our students are going to work in jobs that don't yet exist. So many of the people listening to this, this, this call will be working in jobs which as yet none of us have ever thought about. You're going to be working for organisations that aren't yet trading, producing stuff we don't yet know we've got to have, using skills and knowledge we don't know people are capable of and crucially they're going to be working with people who they'll never meet. I used to struggle with this idea, how could you work with people who you'll never meet? However, over the last few months I think we've all suddenly got very used to this idea. We could work for organisations that you never actually meet the people that you work with. So you work with them virtually. So what does that mean for organisations? What does it mean for uh, career patterns? What does it mean for city centres? What does it mean for, for how people actually communicate with one another? So things are changing rapidly and the, many of the people on this call will be living through these changes in real time uh, going forward. So what does it take to succeed in this new world of work. I thought I'd spend just a couple of minutes thinking about this. I've done a great deal of research onto the new world of work, the impact of, of, of employability uh, in the new world of work. I thought I'd share some ideas with you with this. I've got in particular three tips that I wanted to sort of summarise on. Um, the first thing I want to get across is it's not the 20th century. We're in a new context, a new world now of the world of work. And I've tried to summarise this, which I thought you might find quite useful. So BC, before COVID and AD, after the downturn. If you think about before COVID, proximity mattered. So where you lived in relation to your job was really important. So people before COVID, uh, if you got a job in a new town, people would often move houses. They'd move schools with, for their kids They'd, because proximity, being close to the organisation, really mattered. I think we're seeing now a rise of what we call digital nomads, where you could work in your kitchen for an organisation on the other side of the world. You don't have to be, proximity doesn't matter anymore. Proximity is irrelevant. It's dinosaur, it's a zombie concept. I think from now on we're going to see digital nomads where people live Oh, people live in, in, in a local location, but they work for organisations all around the world. Interestingly, Estonia have now got new visas for digital nomads. They want to attract people to live and work for a short space of time in Estonia, pay some tax in Estonia and then be free to work uh, digitally anywhere in the world. So forget proximity, digital nomads of the future. Before Covid, we used to talk about skills and knowledge today. We're talking about attitudes and behaviours. Crucially, skills and knowledge are being replaced by artificial intelligence and robotics. What the artificial intelligence can't replace though is human attitudes and behaviours. So people are being hired for their attitudes and behaviours over their skills and knowledge, which is increasingly being 
codified and, and turn into AI. Um, in the past, i.e. before March, employers competed for graduates, now graduates competed for employers, of course. Credentials, qualifications used to be the ticket, now it's experience. I was just saying to Charlie, employers are saying to me now, uh, when we start hiring again, the question we're going to ask all young people is what did they do during the lockdown? That's the key. Experience counts. So make sure you're building up your experience. Um, we used to say all experience counts. Crucially, strategic experience counts. So make sure it's relevant to what you want to do. What we've seen over the last few months is the rise of the digital internship. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are doing these new digital internships. Uh, where you where you work for an organization for a short space of time, the organization could be anywhere in the world and you're gaining great experience while helping them with some project work that, that you're, um, you're developing. Financial Times have now introduced uh, hybrid internships where you do a bit of work physically for the organization, but also you do an online digital uh, internship. And of course, finally, we used to talk about CVs. Can you check my CV? Uh, CV RIP. From now on, it's LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the key that people are being hired and other sort of um, digital platforms. So make sure you don't just focus on your CV, you make sure that you start building your LinkedIn profile as quickly as possible. LinkedIn is, is the key to the future. What will people be doing post COVID? There's a great career uh, work futurologist called Charles Handy, and he predicts that going forward, there'll just be three clusters of work or jobs that people will work in. Um, he talks about creators, uh, people who are creatives, um, people who build things and make things, who set up businesses, who, who have new ideas. He talks about carers, of course, and custodians who he defined as managers, people who make sure things carry on and, and, and operate and develop, deliver and develop. So these three C's are absolutely critical, creators, carers and custodians. Um, these are three areas, of course, that computers can't yet replace. So think about, if you think about what you want to do, instead of thinking about a job title, which could be defunct in a matter of months, uh, think about these categories. Am I a creative, am I a carer, or am I a custodian? What really matters? Handy also talks about different types of work. So if you think about it, there are five different types of work that most of us at different times of our lives engage in. Uh, paid work is what we generally focus on all the time. However, more of us now will be doing paid work and consultancy work where you're hired to carry out a project for a short period of time that comes to an end very, very briefly. But of course, people also do work at home. They do gift work or volunteering uh, where they, the, the aim is to help others. And of course, study, as many people listening will, will know all about study work. It's all kind of work, but we we traditionally in the 20th century, just focus on paid work. What I'm saying to you all now is to, is to challenge yourself and think about how, if you're going to stay employable um, for the next 50 years, it's not just paid work you need to focus on, it's these other types of work as well. Uh, so think about work in a different way uh, for the 21st century, rather than focusing on just having a job. There's an old saying, um, to be employed is to be at risk, to be employable is to be secure. And I think thinking about these different categories of work is a key way of managing security. Um, second, it's not good, how good you are, it's how good you want to be. There's a brilliant book, uh, that was the title of it, by an advertising guru called Paul Arden. And I always loved that because he analysed lots of people who'd been really successful in their careers. And he noticed that it wasn't particularly that they were very extra clever, good looking, talented. It's because they were really clear that they wanted to be successful. They were really determined to be successful. And I think that's the key thing. If you really have a, a, cre a key determination, that will drive you through no matter how difficult the environment is. You've also got to be ready to take some knocks. Um, the people who are, who are successful have often failed lots of times. In fact, they've always failed lots of times. But crucially, they've got up, dusted themselves off and had another go. And this great quote from Churchill, of course, someone who failed many, many times throughout his uh, career, failed at the peak of his career after winning the Second World War. He lost the election uh, in 45. Success is going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. So be ready to fail and learn from your failure and, and, and don't worry what happens. But as long as you learn from it, then that will put you in a good position. 
this is a, a, a phrase I use with all our new students. I say basically how you see the world is up to you. It's, you can either see the world as being opportunities nowhere or opportunities now here. It's up to you. It's all about perspective. It's all about how you view the world. Um, I would argue that opportunity is now here, but there are so many people who will see the negativity, particularly going through the, this pandemic and the impact on the economy. And what we will know, because it's happened every time there's been the economic downturn, there's been lots of new organisations, lots of new industries, lots of new technologies develop rapidly. So even though things are hard at the moment, opportunity is now here. You're just going to make sure that you're positioned uh, to take advantage of it and don't be look at the negativity. And then my final point is look after yourself. Um, looking after yourself, making sure that you're physically and mentally in a good place to deal with these, the, the, the challenges that we're facing now is absolutely critical. I know many young people, my own students tell me this, anxiety, uh, worry, stress, it's at an all time high. So make sure that you think about your own well-being. This is a well-being strategy that we use. This was by the New Economic Foundation. We use this uh, and we will be using this this coming academic year. What do we do? There are five ways to well-being. Connect, be active, take notice, keep learning and give. So connect, make sure you, you, you talk to people, you listen to other people, you consciously set out to talk to others and to build up your network. Be active. So, you know, so to make sure you get out and about, you, you, you physically um, walk around, play sports, be active. Um, take notice, notice the seasons, notice the weather, notice the, 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 how great it is to be with other people, uh, notice things that really make you excited, uh, but notice your environment, focus on where you are rather than constantly looking at screens. Uh, keep learning, and that's not just academic learning, of course, but it's also learn an instrument, learn, develop a hobby, uh, learn some new, new skills, but keep learning and keep developing uh, new experiences for yourself, and you'll be amazed at how good that makes you feel. And finally, give. It's an old saying, but it, it literally is better to give than to receive. People who give, whether it's their time, whether it's their resources, do feel happier. So if you're going to improve your well-being, and, and it's crucial for all of us at the moment in particular, then make sure you're doing things for other people as well, and it will make you feel much, much better. So the five ways to well-being are absolutely critical. Um, and my, my final point, I thought he, I read somewhere that Bill Gates was asked to give a, a talk um, in a local school where he lived in the States. And the, the, the school kid said to him, could you, Mr. Gates, could you give us a word of advice going forward, you know, what would you advise us in the future based on your own career? What piece of advice would you give us? And, th and this is what he said. Uh, be nice to nerds. Chances are you'll end up working for one. Uh, I love that. But being nice, being kind uh, is really important more than ever. And so if I think, you know, not just be nice to nerds, but be nice to everyone. Chances are you never know who you'll end up working for. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, I hope you find that useful. And, um, and hopefully if you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to to help with those. So over to you, Charlie. Firstly, thank you very much for talking, giving it your time. There was a lot there that I think was really important, especially some of the well-being things. We've just got a few questions for the last few minutes. So I know you touched on it slightly, but how do you view the job market changing for students now? What can they do, do you think, to prepare for these changes? Well, it's going to change rapidly and we will, we will see, you know, many of the, the 20th century organisations and industries that we talked about um, will, will go through major transformations. So most visibly the high street, you know, you're going to see many of the, the stores that have been there for decades change or, or vanish. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a transformation there. So I think for, for students, um, just to be ready for new industries which will set up and be created very, very quickly. And I think there's the, those three categories that we talked about, you know, the, 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 the creators, the carers and the custodians are really important because I think one area to be creative using technology, but also using our human interaction is going to be where the future is. Um, I, I think we're about to see a huge transformation as artificial intelligence takes over. Uh, I mean, it's ironic, isn't it? 
20 years ago, we were worried about a millennium bug that would that would crash all the computers, ground aeroplanes, close shops, stop people going to work. And here it is just 20 years late. And it's not just a computer glitch. It wasn't a computer glitch. It was a real bug. It was a real virus for humans. So I think I think from now on, organizations will be investing in tech more than ever. But the human things that we can do that computers can't do is where the future is going to be. Brilliant. And um, you spoke about sort of experience and showing that. How do you think is the best way for students to sort of show their experience and personal on their CV, for example? Um, you know, if you say to employees, if you've got any work experience or if you've got any internships, um, that invariably they'll say no. However, if you say, have you got any problems that I can help with? I've never met one organisation that hasn't got a problem that it could do with some helping out with. So, you know, it, to be to be a problem solver is, is absolutely critical. And can I help you with something? Is there something I could help out with? Uh, you know, for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, that's all you need. From, from, from a student's perspective, a young person's perspective, what you need is experience. You need someone to put on your LinkedIn profile. And you need a reference from an employer. That's what you're looking for. You know, so it's, it's not going to cost you anything because you need to leave the house in many cases to do this experience. But but can you help? Can is there something you can do to help an organisation? And that's, as I said, I've never met anyone who doesn't need someone to help them. Brilliant. That's a good, good tip. I know you spoke and you referenced a few sort of books and articles as you went through. Is there anything you'd recommend that students read or watch? Um, help? I, I think there's some great TED talks that you can look. I'm not to plug in my own, but have a look at some some TED talks. Um, I I would I think I think you, you know. There's, there's some really great articles. I, I mentioned Charles Handy because I'm um, I'm a great fan of his and he he was way ahead of the times. He, he's, he's very elderly now. He was way ahead of the times. In the 1980s, he predicted the rise of portfolio working. And I talked about those different types of work. Um, and I think I think, do you know, I think he's he's very relevant now. So if if students have got a bit of time, Look, check out Charles Handy. So he's very, his, his stuff really accessible, and he he was definitely way ahead of his time. But have a look at Charles Handy. Brilliant, thank you. And um, how do you think if people obviously change is happening? We know. So how do you think we should react to change, or how should we prepare ourselves for change that's going to inevitably happen? I think there are different feelings. Um, you know, from people that I work with myself, when 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 the pandemic struck, for some people um, there was a range of fear, um, anger. People are annoyed. This has really derailed my plans. Um, I think sometimes we we have to go along with it, uh, but I think, we, I think ultimately we have to go along with it. But I I would say, never has there been more opportunities, and you're proving this. Uh, never has been more opportunities, more exciting opportunities to create new businesses. Uh, and, and I think, you know, for, for, for young people now, rather than focus on getting an employer, they should be focused on getting a customer. And that's that's the key now. I think, you know, if you're going to stay employable for the next 50 years, it's not working for these organisations, these businesses. They, that won't keep you secure from now on. Most businesses anyway, be, even before COVID, only lasts for about 15, 16 years. So so you you need at your age group and, and people listening now, you need to be employable for the next 50, 60 years. And the only way you can do that is by being having the skills to set up your own businesses. Um, and as I said, it's never been easier. You don't need to hire a factory, you don't need to hire an office, you don't even need to wear a suit anymore. You can work from your living room with a laptop and you can create a business which can change the world. So think creatively and think entrepreneurially. Brilliant. Just sort of, I know you've touched on this already, just sort of finishes off. Do you have any sort of other top three tips that you'd offer to students? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'd say, I, I mean, I've, I've talked about some of that. I think, I, I think I said, certainly looking after yourself is absolutely key. So making sure that you're in a good place and you're up to speed with things. Um, I, I've talked about experience, but, but it, I think contacts are absolutely critical. So make sure that you you, you try and develop your contacts. And, and a great way of doing this, it's an old American technique where, um, say for example, you and I were speaking 
um, and we had a conversation and and I'm looking to try and get into into a into a job in your field. If I come and ask you for 20 minutes, can I have 20 minutes with you, Charlie? Just have a chat with you. That's really difficult for you to say no to. Really difficult. If I say half an hour, you wouldn't believe it's half an hour. 20 minutes. I'm quite, you know, you'll you'll see me for 20 minutes. But the question I've got to ask you at the end is, Charlie, who should I now go and speak to? That's my okay. top. You then give me a name of someone who I then go to and say, oh, Charlie told me to come and have a word with you. Brilliant. That's how you build your network. So um, it's information interview and, and, and consciously go out to build your networks. Perfect. And I'm just, on that, I'm just going to draw us to a close there. Thank you so much for giving up your time today. I really appreciate it speaking. And it's been such an insightful talk, especially into what the future is going to hold. So thank you very much. Thank and you. if you're watching, if you're watching this on YouTube and you've got any other questions, there's a form on our website that you can submit. And then we've got some new talks coming. So check out our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie.